This is the AKC presenting a review of 1952. In Malaya, striking back at the communist terrorists, British troops under Sir Gerald Templar kept up their ceaseless war. In the thick jungle where the going is really tough, our men, among them the first Cameroonians, have forced a decline in the terrorists' activities by hitting them hard and often. In Korea, United Nations forces continued their offensive against the Reds, blasting the enemy with everything they got. Our men held their own magnificently against superior odds. The British boys, among them national servicemen, put up a great show that won the respect of their fighting comrades from other lands. In June, United Nations troops, including a contingent of the King Shropshire Light Infantry, went into Koji Island prison camp to break up rioting Reds who had formed illegal courts in their compounds to murder anti-communist prisoners. After tough battles lasting many days, the Reds were finally subdued. Soon after the riots, Britain's Defence Minister, Field Marshal Earl Alexander, visited Korea to see things for himself. From Korea, the 1st Battalion, the Glorious Gloucesters, came home as national heroes after their inspiring action at Imjin. Then came Private Bill Speakman of the King's Own Scottish Borderers, who was awarded the VC in Korea. In Egypt, terrorists, after firing buildings in Ismailia and murdering a nun in her convent, were forced into the streets to battle with British troops. The Lancashire Fusiliers, the Cameron Highlanders, the Coldstream Guards and the 26th Field Artillery were among those who took part in the bitter conflict brought about by Egypt's demands for control of the Suez Canal. Even as the fighting died down and the terrorism ended, there came a new upheaval in Egypt. King Farouk and his family were forced into exile and army leader General Naguib took over as Egypt's new ruler. Later in the year, Britain exploded her first atomic weapon. In charge of the dangerous test, which took place on the Montebello Islands off northwest Australia, was Britain's Dr. Penny. The flying enterprise, with Captain Kurt Carlson and Ken Dancy aboard, made headline news earlier in the year. After a 15-day battle against the Atlantic, the American freighter went down. At the last moment, the two men were taken off, but not before their story had thrilled the entire world. And what a welcome Falmouth gave them both. In one single night, 31 people died at Lynmouth in Devon, killed by a devastating flood. Many troops were among those who willingly gave their help to the stricken town. Another disaster came during the Farnborough Air Show. Test pilot John Derry and his observer lost their lives when their de Havilland 110 broke up after smashing through the sound barrier. Twenty-five people were killed by falling wreckage and many more seriously injured. John Cobb died on Loch Ness in an attempt on the world's water speed record. His wife saw the fatal run. In a year often dark with tragedy, disaster came to Harrow and Wheelstone Station, where three trains collided. 109 people were killed. But the courage of those who came to help will last as long as our memories of the dreadful tragedy. When General Eisenhower relinquished supreme command of NATO forces, he was honored by men of the British Army of the Rhine. Ike went back to America to start fighting again, this time for the presidency of his country. In a decisive victory, Eisenhower beat his Democrat opponent, Adlai Stevenson, and was elected America's 33rd president. Following an election pledge, Ike made a trip to Korea later in the year to view the situation at first hand and to discuss with the men out there plans for bringing the war to a speedy end. During the year, the SS United States took the blue ribbon away from Britain. 
But the Comet, by becoming the first passenger jet airliner, kept us way out in front in world aviation. As usual, the Grand National provided its full quota of jumps and bumps. At the finish, it was gallant little Teal who romped in five lengths ahead for a great victory. It was full house at Wembley for the finest cup final in years. Arsenal and Newcastle were both in terrific form, playing really good football all the time. Six minutes before the end of the match, there was still no score. Then the Geordies went all out. Here's how Mitchell and George Robledo teamed up to score and take the cup back to Newcastle for the second year running. Charlie Smirk on Tullia, the horse of the year, was first past the Derby Post, five lengths in front of Gay Time, to chalk up another victory for the Aga Khan. The fastest man on two wheels, Britain's Jeff Duke, had a great season despite his injuries. For his brilliant riding, the Duke wins the title Sportsman of the Year. At Helsinki, the opening of the 15th Olympic Games was heralded in traditional fashion by the lighting of the Olympic flame. Britain didn't do so well in the games, and most of the honours went to the United States and Russia. Thanks to Fox Hunter and Colonel Llewellyn, we did win one gold medal at Helsinki. Earlier in the year at Oslo, Britain's Janet Ortweg won us another in the Winter Olympic Games. The 21-year-old girl beat the world's best skaters to do it. Private Granville of the RAOC gave Private Baxter of the King's Own Royal Regiment a pretty hefty hiding in the Army's individual Open Amateur Championships. And Private Hinson, RAOC, outpointed Sergeant McLaughlin of the Royal Tank Regiment in the lightweight final. Another points winner was Corporal Worrell of the Royal Horse Guards, who beat Craftsman Castle of REME in the heavyweight final. There was plenty of action at Aldershot in the Army Rugby Union Challenge Cup final when the 1st Battalion Welsh Guards beat the depot and training establishment RAMC Crookham by 14 points to nil. In the Army Athletic Championships, Sergeant Marsh won the 220 yards by a clear two feet. It was a great day of sport with the ladies putting up a particularly good show. Winner of the long jump, the 220 yards and the 100 yard sprints was Captain Williamson. The mile race was one of the most exciting events of the day. Corporal Weeks Pearson was the winner by six yards. Soccer, as always, brought out the crowds. At Catterick, 6,000 people saw the Army Inter-Unit Cup Final fought between the 7th Training Regiment Royal Signals Catterick and the 67th Training Regiment RAC Carlisle. Here's how Trooper Innes scored the first one for RAC soon after the kickoff. The signal boys hit back and later scored, but RAC went further ahead when Innes scored again and took nearly everyone into the goal with him. With the final score at 2-1, the Winners' Cup went to the RAC. The nations of the world learned with grief of the death of King George VI. Flags lowered all over Britain in tribute to his memory. And then from his capital he was born on a naval gun carriage. His family was with him on his last journey. The cortege journeyed from London to Windsor, guarded by the three services to whom he had been an inspiration in his lifetime. The four dukes watched in silence as the body of our king was carried into St. George's Chapel. God save Queen Elizabeth. Thus in Scotland we proclaimed her, and in London, as throughout the Commonwealth, we heard the ancient words that opened a new chapter in our history. The second Elizabethan age had begun. Soon, as their colonel and their queen, our young sovereign inspected the Grenadier Guards on her birthday. Then, on Horse Guards Parade, the Queen honoured the 2nd Battalion, the Scots Guards, whose colour was trooped this year. In Scotland, Her Majesty received a loyal welcome from the Company of Archers, and during her visit, she met and chatted with many of her peoples. And then, at Clairwen in Wales, she opened a giant new dam. The Queen is assured of the loyalty of all. And in the forefront, 
The British Army is proud to take its place. Long live the Queen.